to BJJ Mental Models episode 80. I'm Steve Kwan. I'm Matt Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. Matt, another 10 down. We're at 80 now, making good progress. Going to get to 100, then we can shut this stupid project down. (laughs) That should be how we celebrate. You know, everyone celebrates by making a big deal when they hit a milestone. We'll just be like, fuck it, we're done. (laughs) Peace out. 100 is good enough. Call it a day. So what have you been up to, Matt? Uh, well, my son turns one tomorrow, which is pretty awesome. So I made some juk, which is like Chinese uh, oatmeal. It's like a peasant dish. And then I also made a sweet potato pie for the first time. Pretty excited about that. And my fucking cat is trying to get near my microphone right now. <laughs> Fuck off. Okay. Sorry about that. So yeah, I've never made a sweet potato pie before. So hopefully it'll turn out good. That's what we're going to have tomorrow. And then we're having this party on Saturday. It's going to be like a social distance thing in the park so yeah should be pretty i gotta fun. ask is this cat like is this going to be your new thing where every episode the cat just totally waylays the podcast yeah he's a good boy <laughs> so i'm a little see, bit annoying but he's a good boy <laughs> see i figured this out what i do is i lock everyone out of the room all of the cats all of the animals lock myself in a side room basically barricade the door so that no sound can get in nothing can get in and then just shoot the shit with you on the podcast Hey, that's what I do. Uh, It's the exact same protocol, except instead of shooting this shit with you, I jerk off. (laughs) Speaking speaking of stuff that's really sticky and messy, um, my (laughs) daughter, my daughter has discovered glue as of today. So she's into arts and crafts. And for the first time, she's realized that there's a whole wonderful world beyond just using markers. And so now, like... (laughs) The thing is, she doesn't like at first she was interested in using the glue to stick stuff to other stuff. But now she just uses the glue stick like a pen. And so everything is constantly sticky in this house right now. It's like a porn set in here. Oh, God, that's disgusting. (laughs) That's what our patrons pay for, though, right? That's right. Well. Hopefully it's hopefully it's like a porn set, but your daughter's not there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She's she's definitely not. No, there's that. That is something, you know, man, talk about like parenting worst nightmares. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if I did that, I consider it my own personal failure, not my kids. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I like to think that I'm pretty open minded, but I have to I have to admit that would be a hard one to get past. <laughs> yeah. All these isn't it wouldn't it be interesting, like all these sacrifices you're making now really don't mean anything <laughs> yeah, you try you try to do everything to try to you know teach your kid good lessons and to try to set her up for success in life and then you know she's going to just totally take a left turn somewhere down the road yeah that that is actually as a parent my absolute worst nightmare <laughs> i think it's i think it's most parents worst nightmare but uh that's why we just got to do do what we can to try and instill those values well it's also why you have to have like a dozen kids right because that way if a few of them go sideways then you know you've hedged your bets and you've got extras yeah exactly that's why i (laughs) had two (laughs) 20 years from now i'm gonna play this back for them yeah i don't know anyway you want to talk about some jujitsu stuff i think think we're gonna talk about (laughs) jujitsu you know i kind of feel like this podcast we cover so much stuff that sometimes i forget this is actually a jujitsu podcast isn't it (laughs) yeah Things are so, getting very abstract these days. We're running out of shit to talk about. Yeah. So today, though, the good news for those of you who want a more hands on topic, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about the concept of surface area, which, you know, stems back from everything that we learned back in high school physics, but it's very applicable to jujitsu. Now, it's something that we put in our concept database a long time ago. And Matt, recently you sort of rediscovered this because you were watching, I believe, a Gordon Ryan instructional and he started talking about this, but he used the terminology blading, if I understand correctly, right? Yeah, that's correct. And I've heard Dan her talk about it as well. Got it. Got it. See, the, I prefer surface area, first of all, because that's a term that we use and, you know, fuck the DDS. We invented this stuff. Uh, yeah, so but blading all- <laughs> just sounds so much cooler. Every time someone says blading, it reminds me of what professional wrestlers do, because that's actually what they call it, where they have like a little razor blade hidden in their tape. And so when they want to add drama to the fake match, they pull out the razor blade and they secretly Hmm. slice their forehead open. So they're bleeding all over. And then everyone goes, oh, my God, it's so violent. There's blood everywhere. Uh, I think they actually didn't they outlaw that in they pro did. wrestling now i they, mean you would know because for some stupid reason you still watch it <laughs> <laughs> i haven't watched pro wrestling in a long time but, so they uh, they did outlaw it because that practice is barbaric and also stupid and it's also it, awesome <laughs> 
<laughs> and it also results in these guys, by the time they turn 50 or 60, their foreheads look like farmland where they've got like just these like massive long divots like carved into their flesh because they've bladed themselves so often what what a job man what a job that's another career that i hope my daughter doesn't go into (laughs) dude i can't believe when i was like a young boy i looked up to those guys and i wanted to be just like them but i that was actually my plan for a while is i'm gonna go into professional wrestling if you oh, think so, that's embarrassing, so glad I'm a, that. almost a 40 year old grown ass man, and I still watch that stuff. And I think that's a hell of a lot worse than worshiping those guys in your teens. And in your honest opinion, like pro wrestling is was so much better back in like the Attitude Era as compared to now, wouldn't you say? It is not even close. It was so much better. I mean, honestly, the most interesting thing about pro wrestling now is that it, it is so bad. Like it's awful, and so so bad. It, yeah, so you you kind of don't watch it because it's enjoyable. You watch it because, like, Vince McMahon, the guy who has run the thing for decades, you know, he's, like, in his mid-70s now, and he's pretty clearly losing his mind. <laughs> and so, <laughs> like, but he's the guy who's kind of in charge of all of the decisions. So the thing that's interesting is you're basically watching this old demented madman try to put on a show and it gets progressively worse and worse and it's like a downward spiral and you keep kind of thinking to yourself wow it can't possibly get any worse but then they find a way every time they find a way i know like i said i don't watch that stupid shit anymore but any any time that i've watched pro wrestling in the last little bit it's been absolutely disgustingly stupid and yeah just i I don't have time for that you mean you don't like those hilariously realistic submissions that they use yeah, I don't know. I, I remember back in the day when it was Mick Foley and Undertaker and Hell in the Cell. It's like, well, you can't really beat that. <laughs> yeah. these, these two guys were legitimately trying to kill each other for your entertainment. It was basically Roman gladiators. Like, the fight is fake, but and the outcome is predetermined. But their intent to kill each other was basically real. <laughs> it's a very, very bizarre thing when you think about it. That It's like, yeah, the fight is fake, but they want to make it look good. So they want to seriously harm each other in the fakest way possible it's a really 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 weird industry yeah it's funny we should do an episode on pro wrestling (laughs) i i would actually totally be down for that maybe for the patrons Uh, but anyway surface area so let's tie this back to something that is hopefully useful for people other than just myself (laughs) and 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 a big a big reason why i prefer the term blading to surface area is because in situations where you are coaching someone during a competition blade left or blade your hips or blade your shoulders or blade the frame I think sounds infinitely better as a command from a coach's corner as opposed to break the surface area or deflect surface area like it's just too many syllables and it's too kind of telegraphs it a little bit and I just think blading is a better command for from a coach's point of view. As well. Yeah, that's actually a really good point, which is that when you're trying to create nomenclature, it's not sufficient to just have names. I mean, it's important to assign names to things because that's how you take very complex concepts and sort of give them an identity and make them easier to digest. But if it's something that you need to dispatch as a command a lot of the time, short, snappy names tend to be a lot more effective. I was reading a book recently where they were talking about this. I I think I've talked about it on prior episodes. It's called Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a very famous book about like how the mind works. Hmm. And one of the things they talk about is that, yeah, it's all, you need to give things names, names that people can immediately understand and relate to. But it's also important to understand that you can't just give these things names. You have to give it a name that's like short, snappy, digestible. So when you're talking about like surface area, yes, it is correct. And yes, you can tell someone, hey, minimize surface area. But that Like you said, I mean, in a fight where every split second counts, the longer it takes you to dispatch a command to the people you're coaching, the less impactful and less effective that instruction is going to be. So let's let's go with blading then for now, then Um, blading basically. And when we're talking about blading and surface area, the principle is basically that you want to when making force with your opponent, you want to minimize the amount of surface area that you're actually using to apply that force. You want to be surgical. I mean, the example is like kind of the the difference between using a sledgehammer and using a scalpel, right? If you're hitting someone with something really big, the surface area is distributed amongst a wide space and that makes it far less impactful. Whereas if you can concentrate the force you're applying down onto a smaller region, 
it makes it harder for your opponent to manage that and it also makes it much more effective. So that's why, for example, when you're driving forward with a leading edge, a lot of the time you want to use something like, you know, the point of your knee because that's you're basically minimizing the surface area. You have a very, very small point of contact for your opponent to make contact with. And Matt, I know some of the examples that you've used are, for example, when you're trying to pass someone if they have a frame up that's very effective, rather than just trying to lay tummy down on top of them where your entire torso is basically the surface area, if you turn to the side and kind of use your ribs, it shrinks the attack zone. It creates a smaller area where the surface is applied and it makes it, first of all, harder for your opponent to deflect, but it also makes it easier for you to ultimately pass and apply that force. (laughs) You said tummy. I can tell you have a (laughs) (laughs) three-year-old. Basically, what we're describing here is uh, two things. The one thing you already discussed is reducing the amount of surface area that your opponent can uh, frame upon. And the other thing that blading does is it changes the force factor. So anytime that I'm pressuring my opponent from the top trying to pass their guard, I can expect a reaction where my opponent's going to create some frames. Uh, I'm going to try and organize my thoughts here because I don't want to go down too many rabbit holes. But essentially, if my opponent is gripping me, Uh, or has like wrist control or whatever, then they're going to be able to work some offense. They're going to be able to off balance me to some degree and manipulate my arms or legs as levers. Whereas if I'm able to blitz my opponent or get into a position where my opponent can't isolate uh, the end of a lever, then I'm going to be able to start pushing the pace. I'm going to be able to be offensive with my passing. And now I take my opponent's guard and I, I turn it into a defensive guard. So Uh, you know, for me, what I think about, I think about my goals when I'm passing the guard and essentially I want my opponent to have a defensive guard, whether it's gi or no gi, I want my opponent to be framing and never gripping. That's kind of my first thing when I'm passing. So back to the idea of blading, the term I believe came from what a knife is. And as you can, you know, it came from Danaher. Danaher is a huge knife nut (laughs) so we hear he loves knives he gives knives to his students you know he's very into knives i i get it i i also like weapons and stuff but uh if you think about how a knife is built you know you got the blade and you've got the handle and the blade is a flat thin part of the knife so if you turn the blade sideways the surface area changes and that is i believe where this term came from and i've even heard danaher during matches when his students are on top passing he gives advice to blade the shoulders blade the frame blah 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 so so it is a term that they use in competition as well so uh, essentially if if i enter my opponent's guard you know uh, i think a prime example would be like the headquarters position or a top half guard position and i'm met with frames whether it's their shins or their arms i'm always going to be met with frames as my opponent tries to retain their guard so So trying to go through a frame with the same force vector, that's going to be very difficult because your opponent has established a frame based on the trajectory of your force vector. So if you just continue with that same force vector, the frame is going to be very powerful. It's going to stop you in your tracks, right? So think about a knee shield, think about a cross frame with your forearms in, in a half guard shell type position. It's just sometimes if you, if you just stay there, it's, it's impossible to just go through these frames. Now, when I'm passing the guard, if, if my, and let's put this, let's just say this is a no gi context. Okay. We'll talk about gi in a sec, but let's say this is a no gi context. I know that as long as my opponent doesn't have wrist control on me, Essentially, these grips or frames are going to be slippery. And by that, I mean they're not going to be sustainable. So it makes blading really an efficient way to redirect these frames because they cannot fix their hands to something. Whereas in the gi, if my opponent has established a frame on my collar or on my sleeve or anything like that, blading becomes more difficult. I find that when the grip is more sustainable, usually by proxy, then blading isn't as usual of a technique. It's more going to be about grip breaking at that point. Whereas nogi, when there's no grips except for the ends of levers and ties and things like that, it's a lot easier to slip from grips. So as you pressure your opponent, as you create reactions from your opponent and 
my goal when I pass now after watching Gordon's stuff is just my main goal is get chest to chest. I don't care about my leg being trapped in the half guard. My goal is get to the chest to chest. So I have to go through multiple layers of defense here. I have to go past their shins, their knees, their forearms until I get to my goal of chest to chest. And that can be a huge task against someone with excellent guard retention who understands what they're doing. So as I'm going through and I'm being met with frames, you know, a lot of the time, instead of keep coming forward with the pressure, I actually kind of stop coming forward and I will change my trajectory. So I'll change either my shoulders by turning them sideways or I'll turn my hips by turning them sideways. Like a, a hip switch is a classic example of lading or even just if your partner is framing on your chest and you redirect your shoulders facing a, a slightly different angle, you'll notice that the frame almost completely disintegrates. The result is going to be forcing your opponent to panic and reestablish frames on this now new trajectory. And it really doesn't cost you anything. It's not like you're, you know, over committing your weight, over committing your force. You're actually a lot of the time when I'm blading, I'm not moving forward at all. I'm just changing the angle of my body. And uh, and then when I find that I've redirected the frame, it allows me to now make my next move and get that much closer to my goal, which is chest to chest, right? So uh, I know it's a bit of a rant there, but it, when I'm entering the top half guard position, like I said, I really don't care too much about my opponent maintaining the half guard. I care more about isolating his head and shoulders and then once I can do that I can I can really start to pin the upper body and then I can like pike my butt up and start you know clearing my knee through coming into a three-quarter mount or a knee cut or whatever my goal is to get chest to chest so a lot of the time to get to that chest to chest position I use blading to redirect frames so let's unpack that a bit because there's a lot of concepts in there that we've talked about in the past and we can probably tie them all together here a little. So first and foremost, you talked about the analogy of blading to a knife, which makes a lot of sense, right? Mm -hmm. And the way I kind of like to think of it when you use the blading analogy is, look, do you want to grab the knife by the blade or by the handle? And if you're going to grab the knife by the blade, do you want to grab it where it's thin and pointy and sharp or do you want to grab it by the flat part, right? That makes a big, big difference. And it all comes down to the sharpness and the surface area of that point. A good example that I like to think of when you're trying to pass the guard is think about how bad it sucks when you're trying to pass and your opponent gets something pressed up against your hip. Like if they're able to tie you up in some sort of spider or collar guard where they basically got their foot on your hip and they're pushing back. The reason that sucks is because you've exposed your hip and your hip is a very, very large surface area. If you're just flat out exposing the front of your hip to your opponent, then you're not really blading. But Matt, to your point, if you switch angles to the side, for example, and you give them the side of your body, it's a lot harder to have your foot remain in place on a person's hip. It's going to slide off because the surface area is too small. And similarly, if you were to establish an elbow knee connection where you've kind of got that structure set up in front, it's a small surface area and it's very hard for your opponent to do anything with that when you've got that strong structural frame in front of you and the frame is very, very small. So passing and blading, when you put them together properly, again, back to the knife analogy, it's very much like, you know, passing a knife through butter. The idea behind blading is you give a very, very small leading edge that your opponent can't do anything mm -hmm. with and you use that kind of like a wedge to drive forward and to pry your opponent open. So very, very solid strategy when you're passing on top. Yeah. And I like the explanation that you gave of how this ties into dominant angles. You know, um, a mistake I made back in the early days of jujitsu is I would just get paralyzed when I was in someone's open guard, right? Especially if it was in the gi, they'd you know grab your sleeves or your lapel or your pant leg and they'd tie you up and I just wouldn't be able to get out. But really the key is to just constantly switch and make sure that you get the dominant angle. If you just sit there facing the person dead on, you're never going to get out. And switching the dominant angle is very, very closely related to blading because when you change angles, generally you want to do it in such a way that you are now exposing less of your body's surface area to your opponent. So rather than kind of like exposing your all of your core where they can just push against you or kick you away, you want to sort of turn to the side and give them maybe access to like your elbow or your knee or the, you know, the side of your hip where they can't get a good grip. And that's so key to passing. 
thing, especially in no gi. I would argue, though, that it also is important in the gi as well. But it is a little bit different mm-hmm. because there are there are ways your opponent can tie you up that have nothing to do with the surface area of your body, exactly. right? If they get a if they get a good grip on your lapel and like wrap it through your legs, well, at that point it doesn't really matter, you know, whether you're blading or not. You've got to find a way to deal with that. But failing that, generally speaking, the strategy of blading is applicable to both gi and no gi. And the idea is give your opponent less surface area to attack when you're trying to pass and open their guard. I mean, I I remember for me, this was a big moment for me when I was getting my ass kicked by my instructor over and over again. And at some point I, I realized like this guy is just he's not giving me anything. There is nothing I can grab. There is nothing I can do to stop him. You know, I, I want to frame, but there's nothing I can frame against. I can't just frame against like his stomach, which is what I'd want to do because all I'm getting from him are elbows and knees. Basically, you know, there's, I'd love to frame against like his chest or his tummy. There it is again, but I can't do it because all that's in front of me, he's got this strong elbow knee connection. And like, I can't put up my forearm and block his his knee, like that's just not going to work. So part of effective passing is making sure that that's the only body part that you really expose to your opponent when you're the person on top. You never want to let them basically get at the soft, squishy stuff. Yeah, exactly. Like by blading as the person on top, it really only gives the person on the bottom, like you said, that sharp edge to frame on. And it can be difficult to frame on Um, an area of your opponent's body that has a really narrow surface area, especially when the angle of their force is constantly changing. Because you can, like a lot of the time I will, if I feel like I'm being met with a frame when I'm passing, like I said, I don't come forward. I will switch my, my entire body left or right. Like you can blade with your hips and your shoulders. You can blame with blade with just your hips and you can blade with just your shoulders. So you can, um, you can really create some dynamic movement just by turning the, basically changing the angle that you're facing, if I'm really simplifying it. Mm-hmm. And that is one of the most effective ways I find in Nogi to redirect levers as frames and get to that chest to chest type position. In the Gi, you know, we talked about when your opponent has a grip on your collar, like you're not going to be able to blade through that a lot of the time. A lot of the time, my, my passing strategy changes completely when it's from gi to no gi. Something that I'm planning on doing is trying to do a workshop. I'd love to do a workshop on no gi passing, and then I'd like to do a workshop as well on gi passing uh, for what I think are the highest percentage paths that I take to pass. But, it, you know, they both sort of funnel to the same finishing position, which it, which my favorite is the half guard, top half guard control, where you're flattening your opponent out. Either there or I'm going to try and go for a stack pass in the gi. So um, those are kind of my main, my main positions. But if it's no gi, you're going to find that blading is super effective against framing because you know, the grips will just slip. But in the gi, it's a little bit trickier than that. You have to be a little bit more surgical because as your opponent frames on you and they take grips, you can no longer just shrug your shoulders or your hips and you're going to have to actually physically break those grips and then progress. So it it does change slightly, but for nogi, man, blading is such uh, an important concept. You know, if you watch any of Gordon Ryan's matches like I, one specifically i can remember is when he passed homolo's guard to at i believe his adcc 2017 and made homolo look like an amateur and eventually got his back and choked him out but he was he got to his headquarters position which is where he basically does most of his passing and then from there he did this like really dynamic hip switch and he just totally shrugged his legs to the side so that would be a great example of blading the frame uh in this case i believe homolo had like a sticky hook like a a headquarters position and then gordon did a hip switch and he totally redirected his legs away so that would be like a really great example of uh of framing you know what's interesting is when it comes to gi and no gi passing with a few exceptions my strategy and my preferred tactics don't actually change that much with the exception of the fact that I will prioritize lapel and collar and pant leg grips above anything else. So if my opponent gets a like a solid lapel grip or a solid collar grip or pant leg grip, I won't really try to, you know, complete the pass until I'm able to deal with that. I learned a long time ago that you never want to leave part of your clothing unattended and attempt to pass if your opponent has like a killer grip on you. But other than that, my strategy doesn't change that much. Now, that might just be because I'm lazy and I haven't taken the time to learn multiple techniques, but that's it for me. 
Yeah, like I, I've I've found that um, when it's a no gi situation, I I like to do what Gordon does, which is essentially split the legs. So if I can get to a headquarters or a split squat, I feel like I'm in a in a position where I can pass. Whereas when I'm in the gi, if I do that, I'm giving a lot to my opponent because by putting one of my legs in between their legs, if they're a really good De La Hiva or reverse De La Hiva player, they're going to have a lot of uh, a lot of ingredients that they need to be successful from their guard. And because they could just grab my pant legs, I can't easily just escape once I step in. So in no gi, I try and step in and immediately try and get my weight over top of their upper body. And I work to get chest to chest from that position. Usually I'm going to look to pummel to the inside position with either my legs or with my arms and uh, continue to deflect frames until I get to the chest to chest. Again, I want to cover this in a, probably a live stream for our our patrons eventually when I can and then in no in the gi it's totally different because if I step into that range if I step my foot into the headquarters position my opponent if they have a good grip on my collar or my pants or both they could easily elevate me and start working sweeps from there so it's like if I put myself in that close of a range in the gi I'm totally leaving myself open to get off balance. So in the gi, a lot of the time, I'm a little bit more frugal with my entry. And I tend to hang out outside of the toe line. Because if I enter, th- if again, if I put my leg in the middle, I give them so much. You know, De La Hiva is so valuable in the gi. Whereas in no gi, you don't see it as much. Sorry, Rob, I don't mean to shit on your system. But <laughs> you just don't see it work that, you know, comparative to sit up guard in no gi. So in the gi, a lot of the time, what my passing strategy comes down to is staying on the outside of the toes and then playing different angles. So I'll dynamically try and move left and right and create a reaction from my opponent where they have to high leg. And then from there, I've basically solidified my blitzing tactics because now they're only high legging and framing when really what they want to do is grab me and and grip me and off balance me. So I stop that first of all. Then once I feel like I've created a good angle and I've put them on their back and I'm forcing them to frame, I'm going to now try and move in and get closer. And then from this position, like if my opponent gives me a high leg, that's a lot of the time all I need to start working into a stack pass. So uh, a lot of the time my gi my gi passing will funnel into stack passes because it is super high percentage. And for competition, it's just so, it's so demoralizing for someone getting stack passes. Just uh, I've realized that the high level black belt they really try and use positions that break their opponent's will and make them uncomfortable. So now I'm trying to adopt that. And I got to say, it's it's super effective. You know, what's interesting is I've heard a lot of people say what you just said there, which is that they shy away from playing headquarters or the split squat position in the gi because they're effectively trying to prevent the guy on the bottom from taking De La Hiva guard, which I understand. But honestly, I've never personally had a problem with that. Uh, you know, this is my favorite way to pass in the gi is I'll intentionally go into headquarters and I rarely ever have trouble with the person on the bottom foot locking me or putting me in De La Hiva. And I think the reason why, is, first of all, because I'm basically built like a hobbit, right? Like I've got <laughs> short little stocky legs that no one can grab. But beyond that, I think that it's because I, I'm blading when I enter. And the way that I do it, is I maintain a strong elbow knee connection because that's that's effectively what an elbow knee connection is, right? You're effectively blading. You're creating a structure by putting your elbow and knee together so that if your opponent goes in on you and they try to they try to free up or pry something loose, they can't really do that because all they can attack is this very strong, very narrow blockage that's right in front of them. They can't get to the rest of your body very effectively. So I don't walk into someone's De La Hiva. Basically, when I'm going in, I'll get that elbow knee connection with my knee kind of pointing forward and I'll go in like that the whole time. So my knee is always in front of my foot. And as a result, I find that guys have a very, very hard time scoring De La Hiva on me. And if they try, I can usually break it right away just because I've got that elbow knee connection. So it's kind of an example of how, you know, when you're when you're thinking of how to engage someone in the guard when you walk into the guard before you even go in like you don't want to give them anything that they can grab on you because like a common mistake when you walk into someone's guard is you literally just walk in you like plunk your foot right down and then they immediately get de la hiva and that's kind of where stuff starts to go sideways but if you 
keep small and bring your elbow and knee together. And basically the only thing that your opponent is ever is ever able to touch is the edge of that blade where you've got your elbows and your knees kind of connected together. It's very hard for them to lock you into a guard, even in the gi, I find. Now, that said, I mean, that that completely falls apart if your opponent gets like your lapel. What the hell just happened? Did you hear that? Yeah. Oh, no, it's you it's 12 appointments today at 8.54 p.m. to tomorrow at 8.54 p.m. 12 appointments? Lovely. You're a busy motherfucker. It's OK. Well, actually, to be fair, about half of those appointments are St. Jean Baptiste Day in Quebec. Um, I don't know why I'm getting a <laughs> notification about that on my phone. There are several other appointments on here, which also are gym classes that I'm definitely not going to go to. And moreover, why the hell is Siri talking to me right now? I really don't understand it. God. Anyway, I'm going to leave that in. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> like I was saying, though, if you when you go into someone's Delahiva or into their headquarters, if you maintain that strong like elbow knee connection, basically you only ever give them the edge of the blade, then it's going to make it much harder for them to kind of pry an arm loose or pry a leg loose and start really attacking you. I guess that's actually another really big benefit to blading, which is that as the guy on the attack, when you're trying to pass someone's guard, it makes it really hard for them to like arm drag you or attack your leg if you're just not giving them an attack zone, right? If you're only ever giving them like kind of the pointy parts of your body, <laughs> you know, it's very, very hard for them to do things like uh, like balloon sweeps or tomo anage or to do like an arm drag because all they're ever kind of getting is like the, the hard end and painful parts of your body. You're not really giving them something that they can actually use to manipulate you strongly. So that's kind of one of the cool things about blading is that it leaves less attack vectors for your opponent. There's just not that much that they can do if all they're ever getting is like, you know, the side of your hip and your elbow and your knee. Yeah. So what what I found with the headquarters position is in the gi, if I if I play it like I do in no gi, like, like the way Gordon plays it in no gi is he's very much bringing his head over top of his opponent's chest, um, which is like very much forward because it's hard to get elevated when you don't have uh, when your opponent on the bottom doesn't have grips. So in no gi, you can totally do that. And and as you start to lower your your upper body to theirs and get chest to chest, you're going to be met with frames. And if they don't frame, then you start your float passing. So this is all like a sequence that I've been using that's been really successful for me. Uh, if they do start framing, usually that opens them up to pummeling, whether it's going to be your legs or you can get under hooks. And then from there, you can totally look to pass but in the gi i haven't had a lot of success playing this same positioning if i try and do that in the gi a lot of the time i get elevated like like elevator sweep style and i need to focus more on hanging back because coming in headquarters in the gi i find if i bring my hips too far up my opponent's body i can definitely get redirected but if i hunker definitely if i hunker down and i really lower my base like if i take a really low split squat position in the headquarters and i keep my my butt close to my heel then it actually can stop my opponent from getting the della heva hook so a lower stance that is not as forward i think is effective in the gi and then from there it's kind of the same idea like one side you'll have your knee cuts and on the other side you'll have your your smash passing and honestly i probably use the smash passing a lot more in the gi because it is so effective and you do have some really good grips to work with there so that that's you know when i enter my opponent's guard i kind of think like like the d-pad on a controller like there's up down left right and those are kind of the directions that i need to move in i either i'm going to pressure forward or if my if i feel my opponent's going to pull me forward i'm now going to move backward and i'm always going to move left to right to add diversity to my attacks uh, so that's sort of what I'm thinking. If my, And any time that my opponent, let's say my opponent pushes me, then I sort of base out and I prevent them from pushing me. If they try and pull me on top of them, then I base out and I kind of hang back. And then from there, I just look for my opportunity to either blade a frame away or if they have a, if I have a gi on and they're gripping me, then I'm going to look to break that grip and then I can continue my passing sequence. So long story short, you know, when we're talking about blading and we're talking about passing, I generally will take small little breaks in the... In in my forward pressure, whether it's gi or no gi, if I'm met with a frame or I'm met with a grip, I stop moving forward because that now becomes a liability for my own base. And then I will address the grip or the frame. I'll blade it or I'll break it. And then I feel like I can continue moving forward. 
but and definitely but as, but as long as that grip is there or that frame is there i need to do something about it i can't just continuously apply my base forward or i'm going to uh, compromise my own alignment yeah and part of it too is if you try to move forward while there's a frame in front of you you normally wind up kind of stretching yourself out and that exposes more of the surface area of your body like the example i give a lot of the time is say that you're in someone's knee shield guard and you just can't get past because that knee is right in your stomach i mean the last thing you want to do is try to keep driving forward into the knee. You're basically just driving your stomach into their knee, first of all, which is not productive. And also, if you keep doing that, what's going to happen is eventually your opponent is going to start feeling your energy and they're going to be able to pull you into something nasty if they want to. Mm -hmm. I agree totally with you that what you should do when you encounter a frame or the guy on the bottom starts getting a bad grip on you, you need to kind of coil back and deal with that first before you continue advancing. We were talking about this a bit on the Discord where some of the patrons were asking us about float passing. I think you talked about uh, float passing and some people were kind of inquiring about it. And yeah, to your point about some of the differences between how you would attack this in Gi and in no Gi, the Gordon Ryan game plan, you know, is where once you kind of float past the person's knees, what you do then is you base very far forward, like you were talking about, right? And basically you've got like your arm and maybe your head on the mat. And so you're leaning really far forward and then you pummel to get the legs free. That can work in no gi, but the problem is in the gi, like you said, if you lean far forward like that, there's just too many things that the other guy can latch onto and grab onto. You've kind of exposed your core and that allows your opponent to do things like regard or get do something with the lapel. Whereas I agree with you that if I'm in that situation in the gi, I don't like to lean far forward when I'm in the person's yeah. guard because it's very hard to control what's going to happen next. So I will lean back until I have all of the grips dealt with and I basically see that there's a clear path forward. Then I'll usually just do nothing fancy like i'll just knee cut and really the knee cut is probably one of the greatest examples of blading right because you know as we know it's a very fundamental pass but it's also so effective it's so hard to stop because if you can clear all of the obstacles so that there's nothing blocking the forward momentum like you're able to defeat the frames you're able to untangle yourself the knee cut is so hard to stop because that is really like the point of the knife it there isn't much you can do to frame to block someone's incoming knee yeah, and, and there's another aspect to this that we haven't discussed, and that's the diversity that is added to no gi passing through leg locks. Uh, in the gi, you're not going to see, at least in IBJJF competition, you're not going to see a lot of people dropping back into leg locks off of failed guard pass attempts or, or blending their leg lock at entries into guard passing attempts and vice versa. You're just not going to see that because, first of all, heel hooks aren't allowed and there, there's just not that many attacks. Plus, there's the fear of getting swept, getting points scored against you. But if it's a no-gi situation and this is a sub-only situation, you're totally going to see people drop back into, you know, saddles and things like that when they're going for knee cut passing, especially like Oliver Taza. You know, this is probably, I think, the strongest example of someone who does this where they will be knee cutting passing and then all of a sudden backstep into a 411. Now they've put their opponent in, in a dilemma where, you know, if depending on on their reactions they might pursue the honey hole they might continue into the knee cut pass or they might even be able to enter the back from there if their opponent comes up on their elbow uh and from that for that example you can see gordon ryan versus yuri samos where yuri g gets up on an elbow as gordon is in the top side honey hole and then gordon isolates a motorcycle grip on the far arm and uses it to do, to secure the back so this is this is a dilemma that is available in nogi and it makes the attacks a lot more diverse because you can sprinkle in those leg lock entries and threaten other things. Whereas in the gi, you don't really have those same options. It's very unlikely you're going to drop back into the 411 if you're trying to do a knee cut pass in the gi because you basically are, first of all, giving up your entire position. You might get swept. And second of all, there's no heel hook opportunity. So it's not, you know, there. Yeah, you're kind of moving into a position that is a strong position, but it's effectively a dead end in the gi just because of the rules. Exactly. Like, I, I always I always love this analogy. I've mentioned it before on the show where I look at gi and no gi grappling as they're the same sport, but require completely different skills and strategies. So uh, an ex uh, example I like to use is ice hockey compared to ball hockey. Because ice hockey is, they're essentially the same sport, 
but your skill set is completely different. In ice hockey, you can, you know, you can coast, you can shooting the puck while you're coasting. So you don't need to take any strides while you're doing that. Um, you know, the, the, your maneuverability is different. You're, you know, I argue that I, I get less tired playing ice hockey than ball hockey. Whereas in ball hockey, like, I don't know if you guys have ever tried to take a slap shot when you're running a hundred percent, it's extremely difficult because you, I remember I played ball hockey a few times a few years ago and like I went to go take a slap shot and I just fell right on my face because I was so used to coasting on ice Uh, and it's it's a totally different game it requires totally different skill set and the strategies are different as well so that's that's sort of the analogy that I use when I'm explaining gi and no gi grappling they really are two different sports especially when you start adding things like heel hooks and stuff like that It, it changes the game completely definitely definitely hey maybe Maybe this is something you can explain to me. Why is it that people who've trained jujitsu for a long time can just kind of like roll nonstop for hours and hours on end, but they do like any other type of activity and they just, they suck at it. Cause let me tell you, I've been looking for other things to do for cardio other than just jujitsu. And so I tried jogging for the first time in about 20 years oh and I thought I was going to die. Like I got so we've got this trail behind our, our place and I had these like grand ambitions of like throwing on the runners and, you know, running right, you know, jogging down the trail and then jogging back. And I thought, you know, this will be probably a good workout. It'll, you know, get break up a sweat and something. But you know what? I, I got like as far as I jogged out of the house to the start of the trail and I was like, fuck, I'm done. <laughs> I, I didn't even make it onto the trail. Like I'm such a bitch when it comes to this. I, it's It's just funny how like you get so used to one type of cardio training that you switch to yeah. something else and it's just like it's totally different body mechanics and yeah that's a that's a good story about the differences between the different variants of hockey it is very much the same in jiu-jitsu i mean there's there's a lot of similarities and i think that the foundation for one definitely plays into the other but as we've talked about on the game planning series that we did on patreon you know yeah your fundamentals can be super awesome but if you fail to tailor your strategy to the particular experience and the particular rules that you're playing under, you're basically doing yourself a huge disservice. You're giving your opponent a massive advantage if they did bother to take the time to tune their strategy. And for a variety of reasons, both um, just the presence of the gi, the also just the rule set, there are a lot of reasons why, even though these are technically the same martial art with just a few variations, the way that can actually play out in competition is super, super different. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, I got a question for you. When you run, what goes first? Because for me, I can like the first five minutes I find when I run are like, that's where I guess my heart becomes climatized. So they're pretty rough. But after about five, 10 minutes of running, my heart sort of regulates and I can run for like quite a long time but it's my knees that actually go first and that's why yeah yeah for me too it's leg fatigue it's not necessarily the cardio although I thought it was going to start coughing up blood the first time I did it but it's not the cardio that goes it's the legs uh, both just from muscle fatigue and also just pressure on the knees and I don't know if there's a good way around that like that's just one of the problems with running is it is very very hard on the knees so our frames are pretty similar like our our the way that our we're hobbits. skeletons yeah like we're kind of barrel chested and we're short and um i don't think either of us are really meant for running um i i i actually really <laughs> like the workout i get from running like i think it i think it really is challenging those first 10 15 minutes of running but you know, near the end, I get to the point where I'm not tired anymore and my legs, like my joints and my knees are so sore. So I'm like, is this really a good trade-off? Like, is this cardio training? I'm the, the amount of damage I'm doing to my knees. Like I just, I'm in right now. I feel like I want to keep my knees as strong as I can. And all that constant, uh, impact. I, I just, I feel like I'm taking years off my, my career there. So I feel like other exercises, like I'm always pushing the assault bike. I love the assault bike. I love swimming. Those are, I think swimming is an excellent cardio exercise and swimming is an excellent exercise that helps you regulate your breathing as well, just like jujitsu. But to answer your question earlier that you asked before we went on a, on a, a tangent there is, you know, how could you roll for so long and then you do another exercise? and you you get tired real quick and i think the answer 
answer to that is because, you know, when you do jujitsu, you're in your gym, you feel comfortable, you know who you're rolling with, you know if you if the person you're rolling with, if you can take them or if they're going to give you trouble. So you already kind of have a, a formulated result in your mind. Um, and the fact that there's nothing on the line, there's no stakes, there's no risks, it's it, it makes it for more of a comfortable, enjoyable atmosphere whereas if you step into a competition you you know there's people around and you're nervous and the person you don't know the person you're rolling with blah 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 all these factors then it it changes quite a bit so um i think it's the comfort factor of everyday training where you know where you are and you know who you're rolling with where you know you can just roll for for sometimes over an hour two hours whereas if you do something where you step out of your comfort zone or you do an activity that you're not really used to or your body's not used to then it's you're definitely going to get tired a lot quicker yeah yeah it could even just be repetitive motion right as you do the same exercise over and over again eventually your body kind of tunes to it and it becomes more efficient because your muscles are used to it whereas if you try something new it is hard right and that's one of the reasons why it's good to shake up your exercise routine i think another big part of it too is that just jujitsu is about efficiency and if yep. you're good at jujitsu and you're not trying to necessarily kill the person you're just playing for position like you would in the gym then yeah you if you're doing it right you're probably not burning that much energy mm -hmm. like the goal is ultimately to kind of stick a person where you want them to be and not let them move whereas yeah anytime you go beyond that into a different activity especially one that you're not used to it's a very different experience but yeah like you said uh it's murder on the knees i'm not sure i'm gonna keep doing it because i you know i've only yeah. been doing it now for a few days and i definitely feel it in my knees already so i think like you said people have different frames and i think maybe my frame is not built for long distance running yeah, I hear that. I, I sort of came to that realization, you know, years ago and, and I used to do a lot of running training to get my cardio up, but I got away from it just because it was just, it was too damaging and it, it was causing me pain. And, and I was like, am I really getting great cardio training? That's why I love the assault bike. There's so many intervals you can do and um, it's more challenging for me than any running. Uh, you can get a workout in way quicker than if you, like if you go run for an hour, I, I honestly believe I could get a way better workout in 15 minutes on the assault bike than I could in an hour running. Like the assault bike is just, it's hell. And the harder you push, the harder it gets. Whereas, like I said, running, you know, you can run up hills and stuff like that. I do, I actually really like running up hills. But after a while, your heart gets used to it. So it's just, you know, the problem too with running up hills is you got to come back exactly. down again. And that is hard on the knees. I, I was just going to say that if you run up hills, you got to come back down. And that like I think running up hills doesn't hurt my legs really at all. In fact, I really like sprinting up hills. It's tough and it's it's awesome. But running like coming back down hills is so bad for your knees. So um, I don't like that. And, and, and to the to the point of, you know, you're more comfortable in your gym. You know, when you roll with people, you know, you also know their games. So a lot of the time you kind of know how to shut them down in the most efficient way. So I, I find myself doing that as well. And that could be a big reason why I can roll for a long time in the gym and not worry about it but if I go against someone in a competition it's like I don't know what their game is I don't know what their strengths and what their weaknesses are and what they like to do so uh, it's kind of more of like it requires more mental quick decision making and that taxes me a lot more than actually like okay I'm rolling with this person I know what their what their favorite guard is I know what I usually do blah 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 so you know having that understanding of your opponent's the choices they make allows you to, I think, be more efficient. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, I know you love the assault bike. You know who else loves the assault bike? Seb? The Undertaker. Really? Yes. Is is this a joke or is he actually use the assault bike? So back on the topic of pro wrestling, which is really what I want to talk about, you know, um, <laughs> the WWE released a five part documentary on the Undertaker's like last journey it's called uh, the last ride and basically it's about how like he's this old broken down bastard but he keeps going out and trying to wrestle and he can't really do it anymore and yeah it's going through like his training process and he talks about the assault bike so yeah you're hmm. in good company there hmm. also the undertaker i believe a jujitsu black belt is he a black belt i knew he did i, I he trains mma does he not I don't know specifically. I mean, with a lot of these like celebrity grapplers, you never really know much about where they stand because they, you know, they're afraid of just random people off the street trying to kill them. Right. So normally they just do privates. So there's not a lot of history out there, but I have heard, I may be wrong. I've heard that the undertaker is a black belt. 
I wouldn't be surprised unless he's under Hegan Machado because Ashton Kutcher is a brown belt <laughs> under Hegan Machado and he doesn't even know how to tie his belt. I'll say this right now. I will put $20,000 of my own money to any charity if Ashton Kutcher can beat me in a grappling match. I don't care what rule set, gi, no gi, Ashton Kutcher, if you're listening, I'll put $20,000 of my own money to any charity you want. Come at me, bro. I don't think Ashton Kutcher is. Actually, you know what? He's I might be wrong on that. He might actually very well be. <laughs> I think we do have a patron with a name similar to that. So I don't know. Can you imagine? Um, oh, my God. But seriously, <laughs> make the fight happen. Kutcher, I don't care if you're bigger than me. I don't care if you're a Higa Machado brown belt. You tie your belt like a white belt. You move like a white belt. $20,000 of my own money to any charity you want. Give the people what they to, want. <laughs> now, to be fair, to be fair, I did not really know how to do a great job tying my belt until I was brown. I mean, I was doing like the the basic technique. And then by the time I got to brown belt, I got tired of how the belt just wouldn't stay on. So I took the time to learn the, you know, like the super duper advanced tie that just doesn't come undone. It still comes undone for me, but works better. Also, by the time I got to black belt, I was still putting my belt on the wrong side with the stripes on the wrong side. So. Well, I think that's actually up to interpretation because like, you see high level competitors, they do it on both sides. I've heard one way is right. Like I, I hang the stripes, I believe, off my left side, if I'm not mistaken. That's where it's supposed to go. But yeah, that I've said, seen a lot of world class black belts that wear it on the other side, too. So I think it's up to interpretation, honestly. Don't think it matters. Yeah, I th- I think that traditionally the bar goes on the left hand side. But the thing is, a lot of people care about that tradition a lot of people think it doesn't matter so you get different schools of thought where some people are really really particular about having the bar on the left hand side whereas some people are not so much i always make fun of our instructor because <laughs> in the in the club logo the bar is on the wrong side oh god <laughs> And I've always said, I'm not going to buy any of your merch until you redesign the logo so the bar is on the correct side. (laughs) Yeah. And you know what else is another funny thing is like, um, well, I've heard that the lapel is supposed to be left over right. But for women, usually women's jackets and women lapels, the, the lapel goes right over left which is kind of interesting. Interesting, because that is the case with women's clothing. Yeah. The buttons, for example, are on the opposite side, but I didn't realize... I think they do it for geese as well. Uh, just, I guess, uh, out of I guess weird. out of like habit or whatever, but most dudes will do left lapel over right lapel. You know, now you got me thinking, is there a competitive advantage if you tuck the lapel in one way? Like, theoretically, if you tuck it the way that most people do, where you kind of go like you tuck the left side in and then you put the right side over, that's how I do it. Is that how you do it? For me, the left, the left lapel covers the right lapel. Interesting. For me, I do it the other way. For me, the left goes underneath and then the right goes on top. Huh. See, I wonder if that gives you a competitive advantage because it probably makes it harder for right-handed people to untuck the lapel. Well, it it would make it more difficult if you're learning the worm guard the way that Keenan teaches it. Mm-hmm. You would switch it up. And Keenan has actually mentioned on the Matt Burn podcast before about how he fought uh, his his instructor at the time, Andre Galvao. He had to fight him at the Abu Dhabi Jiu Jitsu Pro, and <laughs> Andre knew that he had to fight him, so he intentionally put his other lapel over top of the left one so that Keenan didn't have easy access to lapel guards and worm guards and stuff so that's an interesting story as well well you know that i come from a long lineage of people doing like borderline illegal shit with their lapels so people can't grab them no it's it's straight up illegal (laughs) 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 that's an insider for people who I may think not we know actually talked about, about that on the podcast. We uh, I did, think we yeah. talked about that in a previous episode. Anyway, back to the topic. One other thing I wanted to explore before we tie this up. We've talked about blading as an offensive concept, mostly in terms of passing the guard. But I think it also has strong implications from a defensive standpoint. Like, you know, something that I tell, especially smaller people, if they're dealing with really aggressive opponents and they're just having a hard time recovering their guard and, and defending themselves... What's very important is when you put up frames from the bottom, not to put up frames that are easily defeated. You know, you want to kind of make it suck for your opponent to drop their weight down on top of you. You want to use blades as your frames, right? It shouldn't be comfortable 
for them to just squish you and sit on top of you. So that's something that I try to encourage people to do if they're using frames against bigger people. You know, be, think like a porcupine, right? You know, use the pointy parts of your body, use your elbows and your knees so that your opponent is heavily discouraged from just putting their weight down and just dropping their weight down. And I find that that makes it much, much harder for your opponent to flatten you out like a pancake if they're trying to pass. Yeah, no, that 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 is good. Like, I, again, when I'm on the bottom, if I'm going to be using my grips, I always want to have an offensive guard. So sitting up and getting my grips, fighting hard for those grips and then off balancing right away is always more effective than just establishing your guard and then going from there. I always think, uh, as my instructor Rob always says, you want to you want to establish a guard into an immediate kazushi, and that involves gripping or in no gi, I'm gripping your wrist or you know getting a collar tie and I'm moving you around. You know, it's if you if you cannot off balance your opponent, then you are by definition playing defensively, and that's when you allow them to move in and you're now framing. And it took me actually a long time to understand this. You know, only only as a black belt do I sort of understand the difference between an offensive guard and a defensive guard now and what what my goals are to keep my guard offensive and to prevent it from becoming a defensive guard. And uh, to your point, Steve, when you're talking about using um, blading defensively, another example is actually when you're doing judo. So if my opponent has a grip on my collar, a lot of the time I can actually break that grip by blading to the side and making my collar actually sort of break free from their grip. And a lot of the time when you're grip fighting and you're standing up doing judo, if you have a grip and your opponent has a grip and then you blade and break their grip, a lot of the time that's a perfect opportunity to now set up a throw. Because what that does is it, if, if you both have grips, but then you're able to break their grip, you want to throw right away. You don't want to, uh, one thing that Danaher always says is grips do not improve with time. And what by that he means, you know, if, if you hold on to a grip and try and just maintain it and you don't use it to off balance or to establish any attacks, then what's going to happen is your opponent's just going to break your grip or blade and then you're back to neutral or you're even in a worse position. So, uh, you know, a, a classic example I really like is let's say both me and my opponent are standing and we both have um you know we both have same side uh lapel grips like my left hand's grabbing his uh right lapel his left hand's grabbing my right lapel if i can blade away and break his grip a lot of the time that allows me to now enter right into uh fireman's carry which is one of my favorite uh throws because i'm a short little bastard <laughs> but but that blading concept like turning the turning your body away and then immediately turning all the way back in again uh, it really hides the attack well and it breaks their grip. So now you're the only one with a grip and it allows you to enter and really, uh, really underneath them and, and getting that Kataguruma. So again, I, uh, if we're talking about Kataguruma, it's definitely, I would recommend checking out Travis Stevens, uh, YouTube channel. It's probably my favorite YouTube channel for judo. And I really like, uh, Shintaro Higashi, I believe his name is. He's also really awesome. It's funny you mentioned this because I remember a long time ago, I was watching this Caro Parisian DVD on, I think it was judo for MMA was the topic. And this is one of the things that he talked about, which is when when you go into clinch, you don't waste a second. You go for the throw right away. And it's very much like you said, the difference between playing offense versus playing defense. Because if you go in there and you set up your defense, that's awesome, but you're not on the offense, right? You're giving your opponent the opportunity to attack and very much the same when you're playing guard. And to be clear, the example I'm talking about when I'm talking about setting up frames, this is more something you do if you've already basically had your guard mostly passed, like you're trying at this point to retain or to recover your guard. Then you want to start thinking about using bladed frames. But before that, yeah, as soon as you go into guard, you want to be aggressive about that and you want to make sure there isn't a moment where you're you're basically waiting for your opponent to go on the offense. Uh, yes, sir. Awesome. Any more blading you want to talk about? Uh, <laughs> we should totally make the thumbnail a picture of blade. I was going to make it a picture of Ric Flair cutting his forehead open with a razor blade. <laughs> That's also awesome. We should totally do something you like that. Apparently, Ric Flair actually did like some interview with I haven't seen this. so I may be misspeaking, but apparently he did some interview where people were asking him, like, so what is the deal with professional wrestling? And they were basically wanted to know, like, where does the blood come from? How does this work? And he gave them like a live demo. He basically just pulled out a razor blade and cut his forehead open on television. <laughs> 
It's such a fucked up thing. It really, really is. Well, I remember as a kid, I was watching a Hulk Hogan match. I think he was in WCW at the time. And the, the camera caught him just as he was blading. And I was like, holy yeah, yeah. shit. Like he, he literally like brought his hand across his face and then a stream of blood just immediately happened. I'm like, these guys are fucking crazy. And, that, and now none of, <laughs> really that, are. none of that happens anymore because yeah. I guess... I guess uh, it's too graphic or whatever. And the fact that they bleed in a fake fight is crazy enough. But then the method that they use to actually go about doing it is even more insane. Oh, yeah. And I mean, you could argue that pro wrestling is even more damaging than uh, than MMA even at times, you know, like depending on your style and what your strengths and weaknesses are. Pro wrestling, uh, you, you know, you're your body could be way more broken than a career of after a career of pro wrestling compared to a career of MMA. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just has to do with just repetitive injury, right? Because those guys there, they have so many of these wrestling matches, right? Whereas MMA, even if you're relatively prolific, you know, you're only likely going to have a few dozen fights in your career. So it's a completely different story. Yep. Yeah. Well, I think that ties it up, Matt. Any, any questions? Uh, yeah, actually we do. Any closing thoughts first that you want to add? Uh, no, but maybe just to let everyone know that I am planning uh, both a gi and a separate no gi passing seminar. So I, I'm sort of planning that right now. And then when we figure out how to do that, we'll set that up for the patrons. And, you know, hopefully there'll be some some questions and stuff like that. So I think that'd be really cool to go over. Awesome. Awesome. So I do have a question here actually from one of our patrons. And his question is for us littler guys. So he's presumably also in the uh, the Hobbit body type like us. No. Do you favor the Omoplata over the Kimura because of the leg versus arm matchup being stronger than two arms versus one? Just curious, since I've heard a few of your podcasts where you and your brother mentioned the Omoplata is a great move for smaller people. So that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I love the Omoplata because, yeah, mechanically it is very, very strong. You know, you're basically using your your legs against a person's arm. For a long time as a smaller person, I kind of shied away from the Kimura. And the reason why was because I thought it was a, you know, a big man's move. I recall hearing like Joe Rogan say that he heard Marcelo Garcia say something about how the Kimura is for big guys. And I do agree. It can be very, very hard to finish if you're a smaller person. But what I wasn't really thinking about at the time when I thought that way was that the Kimura is a lot more than just a submission, right? Part of the power behind the Kimura is if your opponent doesn't give you the Kimura, like they're, I don't know, clasping their hands together or they're grabbing their gi and you just can't get their hand free. I mean, that's that sucks that you can't get the submission, but there's a lot more options that you can do for positional advancement. So I think the Kimura is very powerful, not just as a submission, but also as a position, right? That's where the whole Kimura trap thing comes into play. And that is super effective for small guys. Yeah, I I always, I mean, it, I like both moves. They're both fantastic moves. They're very different, even though they both sort of apply the same mechanics. But their applications are very different. Uh, I love the Kimura because it is such a strong upper body control. And you can transition to so many positions. Uh, that being said, obviously, the Omoplata, you can do that as well. But but as, as far as an actual system, I find the Kimura is just... I, I think it leaves me with so many more options. Personally, I use the Kimura way more than the Omoplata. And I use it against big guys as well. Now... I think it, the way this question is asked is interesting because if you're asking me to do a Kimura on a big guy versus an Omoplata on a big guy, like, yeah, it, I could I could see why you might think the Kimura is a strength move, but I don't need to use the Kimura to just rip the arm out. I can totally use it to transition to the back. I can use it to get into different situations. So it does take a degree of strength, but more important, this is where I'm going to talk again about the critical control points. It revolves around creating the open elbow and the proper controls lead to a strong Kimura, not necessarily strength. So I actually don't consider the Kimura a big guy move because I use it on big guys quite effectively. I think it's the matter of mechanics and your understanding of how you can break the alignment of the shoulder. So maybe the Kimura workshop would be an excellent thing to do too. That could be super fun. Yeah, I, I really, I guess I really like the Kimura because like Omoplata is awesome. And yes, the, your leg is stronger than your arm. 
But Oma Plata is a one versus one in terms of limb to limb ratio technique, whereas Kimura is a two limb to one ratio technique. Like I have both my arms versus your one arm, whereas Oma Plata is one of my legs versus your arms. Uh, another thing is because of the dexterity that one has in their hands, I find locking up a Kimura, if you know how to do it properly, can be way tighter than locking up an Oma Plata, um, especially in like a no gi application. I think I think Oma Plata in the gi there's way more you know opportunities to stay tight and to stay tethered to your opponent but in no gi man i'll take the kimura all day long interesting see because i love the omoplata kind of regardless and i think a lot of it comes down to where are you trying to funnel to because if you're a back player you're probably going to prefer the Kimura. But if you're more of a mount player or a side control player, the Oma Plata is nice because that's where it's going to take you. So again, really both of these I think are very effective as long as you're thinking about them as systems and as positions. Because yeah, if you're just trying to submit, I mean, if you're on bottom half guard and you're trying to Kimura the guy, good luck, right? Especially if he's big. But if you're looking at that as an opportunity to advance position, then the Kimura can be very effective, even if you're smaller. Absolutely. I just, I just love the Kimura as a control scheme. Um, very like, honestly, I don't often use the Kimura to like you know, rip the guy's arm out and then put it behind their back like a traditional Kimura. Like, obviously, I will if I can. But a lot of the time, I just use it to transition and to invert and get to different situations. You know, a lot of the time, I use it to pass the guard. A lot of the time, I use it to take the back and get to the T position and things like that. Uh, so I, I look at it more as a, as a whole system, but I think if you're going to, if you, if you know the mechanics of the technique, I find the Kimura offers a greater degree of control. That's just my, my opinion. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Well, I think that was a good chat. So just to kind of tie everything back up into a bow in terms of the mental models that we talked about here today, we talked about surface area. And in particular, we talked about blading, the concept of kind of switching to use smaller parts of your body that expose less surface area, which make it a lot easier to do things like pass and to open up holes in your opponent's game. We talked about leading edges. Very important when you're passing the guard, the leading edge is basically the part of your body that is coming forward towards your opponent first and foremost. And it's very important that your leading edge be as small and powerful as possible. So you probably don't want it to be the front of your torso. You probably want it to be like your knee, for example. We talked about force vectors. So understanding which direction the force is coming at when you're trying to pass, because your opponent is going to try to match or redirect that force vector. We talked about dominant angles. The idea here being that if you're getting stuck in someone's guard, switching the angle is a super powerful way to loosen things up and continue the pass. And switching that angle is usually well accompanied by blading because you can then switch the angle and expose less of your body as a result. We talked about the elbow-knee connection. This is a very powerful example of blading because when you put your elbow and your knee together, you prevent your opponent from easily getting at your torso. And that means that there's a much smaller area of surface exposed to your opponent. And we talked about minimizing attack vectors, meaning that you want to make sure that there are fewer things that your opponent can grab onto to attack you. And if you're blading, then you're not exposing a lot of surface area that your opponent can grab onto. So if you do it properly, blading can also make it harder for your opponent to do things such as leg drag you. So a good chat, I think. Hope this was helpful to everybody. Certainly it was very in-depth, and I think it's good to get back and talk kind of about the nitty-gritty of jiu-jitsu again. Matt, anything else you want to add before we plug? Kutcher, you're taking everything I work for, motherfucker. You're cutting a promo on Kutcher. <laughs> It'd be so awesome if we had a match. <laughs> <laughs> I will challenge Ashton Kutcher, but not to a jujitsu match. I will challenge him to a professional wrestling match. Yeah. Come on, Kelso. Let's fucking go. <laughs> Sign on the dotted line. <laughs> <laughs> well, if for some reason you listen to this podcast and you think that we would be fun people to talk to, you can do that on Patreon. As we've mentioned before, this podcast is supported by our patrons, and we've got a Discord set up there where we talk to people, we answer questions, we've got a good discussion going. In fact, a lot of this episode was inspired by the fact that we've been talking about float passing there. So join us on Patreon, and you can get access to 
to our Discord. If you want to support us, patreon.com slash bjjmentalmodels. Again, that's patreon.com slash bjjmentalmodels. The patrons are really the people who keep the show afloat and can't tell you enough how much we appreciate it. You can also go to bjjmentalmodels.com, our website. That links off to everything else that we do. In addition, we've got a database there of all of the concepts that we talk about here on the show, and you can also reach out and contact us from there. You can go to bjjmentalmodels.com slash store, where you can pick up our merch, which is our gi patches, hoodies, t-shirts. You can go to bjjmentalmodels.com slash join to get on our mailing list, where we send out a newsletter once a week. And you can also check us out on Facebook and on Instagram. Awesome. And um, yeah, for everyone who supports us, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for giving us your dedication, your resources. It really helps us make the show and it motivates us more, of course, to give you the best content we can. So thank you. Thank you guys very much. Yeah. And if you have nothing better to do, there is six hours worth of Undertaker documentaries on the WWE network that you can watch. So there you go. (laughs) Oh, boy. I can't believe people pay for this. All right, Guys, well, would you, I, I would, you not, would you not pay to see me fight Ashton Kutcher? I mean, come on. I I would absolutely pay. Yeah. It's too bad he's like basically a white belt. <laughs> I, you know, I wonder if he's ever going to vindicate himself. I figure at some point there's probably going to be more footage that gets put out that puts him in a better light. But we'll see. Anyway, yeah, I would I would absolutely love to see that fight. All right, guys. Thanks for the chat. Take care, guys. Bye. See you next week.